about four minutes late, and I know that our speaker, our speaker tonight uh, doesn't like that um, tardiness, so I think we should start. I don't think uh, our gentleman from Greece needs an introduction. <laughs> but since he's all given us something to drink, and uh, you can't drink it until he lets you drink it, I will, I will just turn the mic over to Farmer Brereton. Thank you. Okay. For Founder. Yeah, thank Our you. founder. First of all, it's so nice to be with so many friends, colleagues, former teachers, former students in this environment of learning. It's just such a privilege and I thank you all for coming tonight. Especially thank you to Sandra for the wonderful work she does with the Schemmel Forum. And I have something special for you tonight. I thought we would start with this. This is Mastique. And I don't see any <laughs> faces of recognition. And I'm so pleased because that means I can tell you what this is. There is an island off the coast of Turkey and its name is Chios. We'll understand why Chios is so important to us momentarily. But there's a tree that grows only on that island. And a resin from that tree is used to make this liqueur. It's called mastique. When I found out about this, I was in Greece for three weeks and I just came back. When I found out about this, I got the last two bottles in Manhattan. <laughs> I bought them both and I brought them to you. And the reason this is important is that Chios is the island where Homer was born. So I would like to offer a toast to the great epic poet Homer with a drink from his island, Mastique. To the great poet. Hear, hear. By the way, we still have another bottle of this because we didn't give you very much to start, but we have plenty more if you're really thirsty. This is a picture of the sunset at Delphi two weeks ago when I was there. And I thought we would start with this. Just a nice environment for us. Let me give you a little background as to why I'm here in the first place because it's a little bit unlikely. And perhaps that will put into context some of what you're going to see. As an undergraduate in college, I was a history major and loved this stuff. But then obviously when you undertake a job of medical school and all, you have to put this aside. But later in my life, maybe 20 years ago, Sandra, a little bit, I don't know when the Schemmel Forum was founded, but we started talking a group of us and saying, Let, let's get back into the, the great works of art. And the first that we tackled was Dante with Rebecca Beale. It was so successful. Immediately, we discovered the wonderful faculty that exists here, and some are already here. Dr. Stephen Whitaker is a mentor of mine, and so is Maury Myers. And both of them have taught at the Schemmel Forum, and I happened to take Stephen's course <coughs> on the Odyssey. It was compelling. By the way, he taught himself ancient Greek, and he reads ancient Greek, and he can tell you things about Homer that no one else can. So that was such a wonderful experience that I decided that when I retired, I would really take this on. I needed a task, a, a job to, to take on. And so I, I made a commitment to Homer. And those of you who know a little bit about Homer, my wife will be so glad when these glasses are over, I have to tell you. Oh, that those of you who've read Homer will realize the significance of this as it was to me. I had a house in Pennsylvania, no longer do, with a nice driveway and a red-tailed hawk lives in that beautiful woods. Almost to the day, I, and Al, you know the hawk, we've talked about him. He lives in your property too. <laughs> Lots of stories about Al's hawk and mine. I would see the hawk flying with one of Al's rabbits and I'd say, I know where he went. <laughs> anyway, so the red-tailed hawk as I was driving down the driveway, I just made the commitment to really take Homer seriously. The red-tailed hawk flew right over my car and off to the right. Now, those of you that have read the Iliad and the Odyssey know that Homer uses raptors in very important ways as omens. And when they fly off to the right, 
good things are going to happen. <laughs> and I, I was shocked by that because I'd known this hawk for 20 years, or one member of the family anyway. It never did that before, but it did that week. And another little omen that occurred to me when I was in the island of Kefalonia two weeks ago, and I'll show you some of the pictures where we were looking for Odysseus, his original home. I was there the last night in this empty hotel, and I felt for the first time an earthquake. The whole hotel shook. And Poseidon was saying <laughs> goodbye to me. <laughs> so I have such an affection for Homer, he's sending me omens with birds, and shakes from Poseidon. And so that's the context in which I bring these stories to you. Um, this is going to be a class probably not like anything you have done in the past. And let me sketch it out for you in the hope that it will meet your needs. And by the way, if it doesn't, or if it does, I'd love to know about it. There are six sessions. In the first one, we're going to talk about Homer and why he's important. And this lets me run very far afield. We'll go into some very unusual places and talk about some fascinating people. But we won't talk about the Iliad or the Odyssey. We're going to talk about Homer tonight. But for the two classes after this, we will get into the Iliad. And because I wanted to do this differently so it's not boring, uh, what we're going to do with the Iliad is use the language, the beautiful language that Homer uses. Now, this is in translation, of course. We're using Fagel's translation. Please, if you have other translations, you'll need Fagel's to get the right uh, li uh, lining, uh, uh, the lines lined up. But we'll use the Iliad for the language. And the way Homer tells story, it's stunning. And because the story is linear, it starts here and it ends there, it's not a complex story. It's about a war that has a beginning and a middle and an end. So we kind of know where it's going, and so we won't worry too much about the story. We'll worry about the language and talk about Homer from that point of view. But for the fourth and fifth presentations, we'll be talking about the Odyssey. And we will not be talking about the specific language. We'll be talking about story. So we won't be reading the exact lines that we'll read in the next two weeks for the Iliad, but we'll be recounting the stories and inviting all of us that know one of these stories. If you'd like to take one on, you can present it briefly. And we'll go through the story part of this because it's so circular, so circuitous, and so fascinating as uh, a, a difference, a major difference compared with the Iliad, that the two together, the Iliad and the Odyssey, I think, offer us a context for continuity for so many important things. And the last talk will be related to my interest in Jungian psychology, which began in this community through Father George Schemmel and Jean Monick. And uh, I now am on the board of the Jung Foundation in New York, and I teach and study there. And it became so apparent to me when I was invited to use Homer as a model for a masculine individuation from a psychological standpoint and to see how much Homer really understood about the human psyche. So the last talk, number six, will be that. So we're going to have it different, uh, have different ways of talking about this, and I hope have a lot of fun. If you've not read a single word, that's OK. If you know the stories by heart, that's great. So don't worry about if you have or have not read this. We'll go through the stories as, as we can uh, so that they will make sense to you as we discuss them. But I don't want you to feel uncomfortable that you may not have done as much as you had intended. <clears throat> this is a beautiful sculpture called the, uh, this, this is Homer down here. And it's the deification of Homer. He's sitting here with his two children, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And this was displayed here uh, in New York at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, but it's from the British Museum where it, it resides now. But I thought that Homer was seen as almost a god uh, by the ancients. And this kind of beautiful sculpture was prepared for him uh, in honor of him. And this is the way the ancients thought about him. And I thought it would be appropriate uh, the apotheosis of Homer is what this is called, and it's very appropriate. Finley, who's a wonderful historian, has this sentence, and I believe it. The history of America begins in Western Europe. The history of Western Europe begins in Greece. The history of Greece begins with Homer. That's why Homer is so important to us. If you look at our history, and how we see ourselves. Go all the way back to Herodotus and Thucydides, up to the present. Homer is foundational for how the Greeks thought about themselves and their history. 
Now that doesn't mean there weren't many other fascinating, wonderful writers at that time. But we'll discuss why Homer captured the West and other stories like Gilgamesh, for example, or the uh, shipwrecked sailor in hieroglyphics did not. Homer caught us through the history of Greece and because, the, and, and I agree with Finley, the history of Greece begins with Homer, that's where we're gonna start. It's, our, it's foundational for us in the West. Part of the interest that so many people have had is to say, well, I really wonder, was there a battle of Troy? Uh, where did Agamemnon really live? Was Mycenae really a town? Those are factual, historical questions of relevance. And they're a wonderful rubric upon which to hang a story. But the story can be embellished. It can be expanded. It can become not necessarily true in a historical sense, but utterly true in the psychological or spiritual or human sense. And that's where mythology comes. So I'd like to read this with you because so much of what we'll be talking about is not only history, but myth. Myths are among the subtlest and most direct languages of experience. They're exact moments of signal truth or crisis in the human condition. The mythographer, the poet, is the historian of the unconscious. This gives to the great myths their haunting universality. Why does a story like the Odyssey or the Iliad capture us so? For 2,700 years, we haven't been able to let it go. There is something fundamental in that story that is profoundly truthful for ourselves. And we're going to find out a little bit about what that is, I think. <coughs> it is through the artist that we learn about our soul. The biologist, the physician will tell us about our biology. But what about the non-corporeal aspects of us? What about the psychological, the spiritual parts of us? And how do we think about that part of ourselves? And the artist is the one, in my opinion, and you can disagree or we can discuss this, who has the best way of doing that. Now this hierarchy here is mine, uh, but I think it makes some sense. If you think about artistic manifestations of human behavior, I think the first one probably had to be spoken language. I don't know what they said. I don't know in what language. It may have been a little bit more than a grunt. But it was a communication that had some symbolic meaning. We don't know what that was. Next, ritual arrangement. Why did they assemble those things like that? We'll show pictures of this in a minute. I'll show you examples of each of these. Decoration. Well, we can come to a cave wall and put some really beautiful stuff on it. And we can look at that beautiful stuff, but not really know what the artist was thinking. We can say, wow, that's great, and this is what I think, but what was the artist thinking? See what I'm saying? When we get to painting and music, the same is true. It's beautiful, we may like it, we may be able to reproduce it, but what did it mean to the man or woman who made it? And we don't know that. Architecture, I'll show you a beautiful temple that's 12,000 years old. It's magnificent, but what does it mean? What was it for? We can only conjecture. But written language, that's where the artist gets a hold of us. It's through written language that the artist can tell us exactly what she or he is thinking. What is the poetry that is being presented? What's the story? So it's through language that can be communicated, and that's written language. The emphasis here is written. And we'll talk about that. Where did that come from? And why is that important for our understanding of Homer? So at the beginning, at the end of this list, I have language. Language spoken, language written. That's where so much of the importance of the artistic understanding of the human soul, I believe, comes from. <clears throat> Has anybody ever seen this? This is so cool. This is called the Macapansgat Pebble. It sits in a tiny little enclave of the British Museum. And the people who put it there think it may be the most valuable resource that the British Museum has ever had. The Macapanscat pebble was discovered in South Africa. It's called a manuport, and we'll explain why in a minute. But it's obvious what that looks like, isn't it? 
a human face. But there's something important here. That stone was never worked upon by an artist. It was just picked up. And it was found remote from where that kind of stone was discovered. In fact, it was found in a grave. Would you like to see a picture of the person whose grave this was discovered? <laughs> Australopithecus africans, three million years ago. I have no idea why he or she picked that Macapansky had pebble up, but it was buried with him. And if we assume that he recognized the face in that stone, what is it? What artistic representation did that mean for that individual? And what does that mean for us? For me, it tells us how archaic our appreciation of the artistic is and how far back we have to go to understand that aspect of ourselves. And if we've been doing this kind of thing for three million years, let's take a look at some other examples. This is a cave in southern France. And all of these stones here have been arranged. But they've been arranged by Neanderthal 175,000 years ago. So we've gone from three million years ago to 175,000 years ago. It's lovely. I have no idea what they were doing with that in the same way that I have no idea why Mr. Macapanscat picked up his pebble and had it buried with him. Let's come a little closer. These are shells discovered in Morocco. They're 80,000 years old. There are tiny holes in each one of these, and they're strung together as beads. Now, I don't know who wore them or why. They would be lovely. We see people wearing things just like that today. And how the person who wore these perceived this artistic expression, I have no idea. We can only guess. This is from the cave of Chauvet. It's one of the caves that I have not been in because you can't get in it. I'll show you some that I have been in. This was most recently discovered about, oh, 20 years, 15 years ago. Are you, have you all ever seen the beautiful documentary, Cave of Forgotten Dreams? It's a documentary of how this was discovered. A couple of spelunkers were coming down the side of a cliff, stopped for a drink, and felt a breeze coming out of the cliff. Moved a small rock aside, realized there was a hole. Enlarged the hole and let themselves in. They had a lamp on their head, and they were smart enough to realize as soon as they saw paintings on the wall, they said, we're out of here. Jean Clut, who was a person Leslie and I have met, is the head of French archaeological preservation in the ancient caves, was called immediately in Paris, and he said, close it up, don't tell anybody where you are, I'll be there tonight. And so when they found this place, the Chauvet Cave was explored in a perfect way by the archaeologists and anthropologists that were appropriate to that and not exploited by somebody who had just discovered it. And this was found there. This is a stalactite hanging down from the roof, but you can see there's the head of a bull and the genitals of a woman. This is the original chimera. This is the original minotaur. Who painted it? What they were thinking? Why that was important? I have no idea. But language like this, art like this, uh, is all over the caves uh, throughout Europe, all the way to the Euro Mountains. We see these beautiful manifestations of the human soul, but we do not know what the artist was thinking. This is from Lascaux, which we did see. It's the only painting in Lascaux where there's a human figure. And when you go into Lascaux and you're, you're, you're surrounded by these magnificent paintings on, on the walls and the ceilings, it's the Chartres of, uh, of Paleolithic caves, the only picture you have of a man is that. Look how primitive that is compared to some of the magnificent paintings of aurochs and bison and, man, and animals that we don't see anymore. You can woolly mammoths, woolly rhinoceroses, Irish elk, animals like that that are painted on these cave walls. And look what you have. You have a shaman, that's what we call him, don't know if it was, with a bird mask, an erection, 
and a bird staff painted next to an animal, an auric, that's wounded with its bowels, entrails coming out. That's a powerful painting. I would love to talk to the person that painted and said, what was going on? What were you hoping to do or to represent? We can only guess. This magnificent structure comes from Trois Frères. Trois Frères is a neat cave because it's in the Pyrenees and owned by a family named the Beguin, Count and Countess Beguin. We had lunch with them. They escaped the French Revolution. They were so far away, the French never got down there to decapitate them. So the Beguin family kept their farm, happened to be in the Pyrenees. And it just so happened that Count Beguin's great-grandfather discovered a cave on his property and started to excavate it. He was very smart. This was back in the beginning of the 20th century. He decided that he would only excavate for six weeks a year because the advances in the technology and understanding of how to explore Paleolithic caves was advancing so quickly. He didn't want to do too much too fast and save some for the really great explorations that could be done later, and it's still being done today. But this is a unique figure in his cave, and it's called the sorcerer, the sorcier. And if you look at this, you realize it has the antlers of a deer or an elk, the eyes of an owl, the ears of a wolf, the body of a lion, the only anatomy of a human are the genitals of a man. And Le Sorcier sits in the wall looking out at you as you come into that part of the cave. It is stunning. I would love to talk to the guy that was painting that, say, what were you thinking? What was it? Let's leave painting and talk about sound. How does sound reflect our understanding of the human soul? And how long has it been going on? This is a bone flute <coughs> discovered in a cave in Germany. It's made from a vulture thigh bone. It's 40,000 years old. And when you pick it up and play it, you can't play this one, but another one like it, it's a perfect pentatonic scale. It's black notes of a piano. Somehow in our brains, we know this, we have a sense of the, of the frequency of various notes and how they relate to one another. And these people were making a bone flute out of a vulture thigh bone that could play a perfect pentatonic scale. I don't know what the music sounded like, but I would love to hear it. And I don't know what it meant. This may be the oldest temple. It's Gobekli Tepe. It's in the middle of modern day Turkey. It's being excavated now. It's only been recently discovered. 12,000 years old. I mean, this is just the beginning of the agricultural revolution. We were just beginning to plant wheat to raise crops. And, uh, and to domesticate animals. But this huge structure with beautiful bas-relief sculptures of birds and, uh, and reptiles and snakes sits there. I have no idea what they were doing or what their religion was or why they built it. But it was certainly important. An awful lot of resources went into this. <coughs> this is a picture of Stonehenge. When I showed it to my grandchildren, one of them said, Oh, did you and Anna used to live there? <laughs> I said, well, well, we are pretty old, but no, that's not, that's not where we live. But the reason I put that up is here's Stonehenge, 5,000 years old. We really don't know. We know some things, the wonderful astronomical calculations. We can find the summer solstice and the, and the vernal equinox. We can do all kinds of neat things with that building, but we really don't know because those people haven't left us a record that we can understand. All they've done is left us their beautiful architecture. So you can see with all the examples that I've given us of an artistic manifestation of our soul, we really don't know we conjecture. But that changes when we can write. And so this is going to be a turning point in this part of our conversation this morning. This beautiful papyrus fragment is the oldest existing piece of Homer. It comes from the third century BC, and it's in ancient Greek, and it's the oldest fragment that we have. <clears throat> so let's talk about Homer. Who was he? He was a poet from Chios. We've already toasted that. Chios is an island off the west coast of Turkey, only seven miles. You can see the Turkish mainland from Chios. And it's just a little bit 
uh, distant from Lesbos, where Sappho came from. So the two great lyric and uh, uh, the lyric poets and the epic poets came from two islands, very close to the Turkish coast. Everybody thought he was terrific, and everybody wanted him. So we don't really know for sure that he came from Chios. We believe he did. But Athens, for example, really wanted him, and they made a big effort to conscript him and to have celebrations. And we'll talk about Pisistratus, who was one of the tyrants that ran Athens. He began a Panathenaea, which is a big celebration in the 6th century. Uh, and he conscripted Homer. He said, Homer's Athenian, and we're going to do everything in Athens. But I think he was from Chios. But seven cities wanted him. He came from a long line of bards. If Homer lived in the end of the 8th century BCE, that's between 750 and 700 BCE, he was talking about, his epics talked about stories that had occurred 400 years before that. His two stories, the Iliad and the Odyssey, we've said, are attributed to him, have been told, we assume, since the beginning of that period. And that means that somebody had been telling these stories for three, four hundred years. I think it's very likely to be true because by the time we get to Homer, they are so well done. They are so well constructed. And the genius of Homer at being able to do this was so extraordinary that they come to fruition in him. But there's a 400 year history before him of these stories, these poems being read. He comes, uh, is he blind? I don't, I don't know, I, I doubt it. It's said that he was a blind poet because Demodocus, who's one of the figures in the Odyssey, was blind uh, and, was a, and was, a, a, was a, a bard, a poet. But there's no evidence that he was. And he describes things with such clarity uh, that I suspect he probably was not blind. But I don't think it's important. And he was a rhapsodist. He was singing these. Let's talk about how he presented his stories. The two epic poems. <clears throat> The Iliad is 16,000 lines long. It's the longest, and, it's and it is the oldest. As best we can tell, it was written about 30 years before the Odyssey. So it came first. Whether it was simply the compilation of many stories, and Homer was the best at doing this, and he simply brought them all together, and, and then that synthesis became his, and he then subsequently presented us with the Odyssey. I don't really know, but I think there's a difference in time. The Iliad's older and the Odyssey's younger. Let me say now why that may be important. One of the things that struck me was how the two stories go together and how different they are. And if you agree with me that the Iliad talks about the first half of life, the development of one's abilities, and the Odyssey is about the second half of life, the meaning of having developed those abilities. Those are two very different points of view. And I think that Homer knew that, did that. The Iliad is the older, the Odyssey is the newer, and I think they do provide us a balance of, if we're thinking from psychological terms, the first half and the second half of life. Much more about that later. The Odyssey is 12,000 lines long. Now just think of the challenge that Homer would have. He comes into town, this is how he earned his living. Everybody come into the, wherever they were, the, the theater, and they were expecting somebody to tell them a story that's 16,000 lines long. It's gonna be sung, he's gonna play on a lyre, and they already know the story. There's no secret. Everybody knew the stories. So how was he going to keep people spellbound? And it wasn't what he said, it was how he said it. And how he presents these stories is so uncanny. You'll see that as we start to go through them. The genius of Homer is to keep you on the edge of, the, edge of your seat even though you know the outcome. There are many different characters, in the, especially in the Odyssey. If I mention somebody or a character that you're unfamiliar with, say, hey, give me more about that, because I don't want to confuse anybody. And we, if we bounce back and forth a little bit, I'll apologize. But as many of you know, in the Odyssey, there's a, there's a creature called Polyphemus. He's a cyclops. Well, if you're going to sound like a cyclops, you have to sound pretty scary. 
And I assume Homer did. But when you have to sound like a 15-year-old girl who discovers Odysseus naked on the beach, you have to sound like a 15-year-old girl discovering a big man who's naked on the beach. And that's a different way of talking. So Homer has the challenge not only of presenting stories that people already knew, that are 16,000 lines long, singing them, but also presenting them in character. And I think he did. You can see why I have such respect for his incredible talent. There was something else. This is poetry. These aren't just stories that he's spinning. He's doing this in dactylic hexameter. Ba, 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 and then a spondee, ba, ba. It just so happens that ancient Greek is perfectly suited to dactylic hexameter in the way that iambic pentameter is suitable for modern English. Modern English poets write in iambic pentameter. When we met Emily Wilson last week, for those of you that came, her translation of the Odyssey is in iambic pentameter. That's what she chose. But it's in dactylic hexameter, so Homer is not only doing all this, he's, do, he's, he's doing it as a poem. Now, one third of it's repeated. There'll be epithets, there are stories, there are metaphors that come back again. You've heard, of course, the beautiful phrase, when dawn with a rose red finger shone once more. Rhododactylos eos in Greek. That comes up many different times, but it makes it easier for Homer to get the story right, and if he needs a particular meter at that particular part of his story, then he can pull whatever model he wants to fit the poetry. It's brilliant. There are 41 different epithets to Achilles, depending on what he wants to say about Achilles and where the story is. Multiforms. One of the most interesting books that I read was an analysis uh, of the Odyssey and how Homer used repetition with similar characters in two stories that would remind him of what was to be said about each one. And you don't really see this while you read it, but as you go through the analysis, I was so impressed with these subtle techniques that were obviously present and available to him that he could cycle through and come back again with a different character, a different, slightly a different story, but this would help him remember what was going on uh, when he's dealing with such a complex topic. There are recurrent episodes, phrases, and epithets. We've said that. And meaningful names. Let's start with uh, Odysseus. Odysseus means pain, suffering. And his grandfather, his maternal grandfather, named him that. His mother is Anticlia. <coughs> Odysseus' mother is Anticlia, that means against fame. We'll talk about why she might have felt like that or been like that, but the point is that Homer is using the names of the people in his stories to tell you a lot about them. It's not just this is their name, this tells you something about them. And the last thing to mention is these are improvised. They're not memorized. You cannot memorize 12 or 16,000 lines. Every time he told us it was different. But he had these techniques for how to come together in a story and how to put these things together that he could improvise the Iliad and the Odyssey in dactylic hexameter, singing it with a lyre and keeping you spellbound for two weeks. Yeah, I, I have the same reaction every time I think about that. How did he do that? Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? I can't tell you exactly how it sounded, but Jeffrey Duban, who is a very good friend of mine, introduced to me by Leslie in New York, has written the most definitive book on Sappho. And he sent me this. He said, Homer, if you want to know what Homer sounded like, this is as close as I can get. So let me see if I can play this for you. <laughs> I think you're all probably very happy that I'm not speaking to you in, <laughs> in that way. But did you hear how it goes up and down at the end? You have to sing it because ancient Greek is sung in a, lot, a lot way, in a lot of ways like modern Chinese. If the, if the note goes up at the end, it's a different word or if it goes down. 
So you can't just say it. You have to sing it. And, you have, and he accompanied himself on a lyre. And that's perhaps as much as it sounded like. So why is Homer important? Did I get the right thing? Yeah. In my opinion, and I'd welcome comments. By the way, raise your hand if you have a comment or a question or an interruption. They would be welcome. It's a great story. It's the first work of the Western canon. We'll talk about that a little bit. Let me mention it just now, maybe more later. There are other stories that are older. Gilgamesh is older. Shipwrecked Sailor and Hieroglyphics is older. But they didn't have the staying power. They didn't have the capacity to spread throughout the entire Mediterranean. We'll talk about why in a minute. So Homer, even though he's not the oldest, he's clearly the best. And he's the first work of our Western canon. And for the first time, through the artistic vehicle of an epic poem, we have a clear vision of the human soul. That's why we went through all of those different artistic manifestations of the human soul, and all of those are conjectural. This is not. Homer is telling us who we are. He's telling us a story that we fully understand. And that's what his genius is and why he's so important. And an expression of the human soul. But I mentioned we still have him, and he was spread very quickly. There's the invention of the alphabet for the first time. I'd like to show you at least some of my thinking on this and how the two go together, the invention of the alphabet and the appearance of Homer in ancient Greece. But as you can imagine, this was a seminal event in human history because for the first time, we could write what we say and we could say what we read. You couldn't do that with anything else. How did this happen? I went back. There's a wonderful book published recently on Paleolithic cave painting signs. These are not the paintings of the bulls and the oryx and the woolly rhinoceroses. These are the signs that you can find in the caves, all the way from Altamira, which is northern Spain, all the way to the Ural Mountains. Just take a look at this. You can get a sense of simple diagrams. You can see yourself doing anything like this. And then take a look at ancient Greek. This is the 8th century BCE. So we have planiforms and tectiforms and all kinds of things adorning the cave walls for 40,000 years. We don't know what they mean. We have no idea. Although we find the same symbol in different caves over thousands of miles. We don't know what it means. But here's archaic Greek. I am not a linguist. But you can see the similarity, at least in my, to my eyes, between the two. But what was it that happened? We'll get there in a moment. This is. Hieroglyphics, as you can imagine. Hieroglyphics is not an alphabet. By the time hieroglyphics stopped being used, which is early in uh, 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 the first millennium, there were 6,000 symbols that had to be known. Nobody could do that. Uh, no, no, no student could do that. Very specialized people were capable of doing that. It was not an easy language to write. And it wasn't until Champignon founded uh, the Rosetta Stone in 1799 that we were able to decipher it. So at least we know what the hieroglyphics means. And we can find interesting stories in hieroglyphics, and I've mentioned the shipwrecked sailor. But hieroglyphics, and the next language we'll show you, which is cuneiform, were primarily for um, political and economic purposes. I, Nebuchadnezzar, killed you, Xerxes. Or you owe me 14 barrels of wheat. Uh, there was nothing literary or poetic about those languages. That much. Now, I will be criticized when I make an exclusive because there are some, but most of the time, the languages we use for political and economic purposes. You are having mentioned that reminds me of your being here a couple of springs ago over at Leahy and, and the idea of the Iliad as the national epic of the Greeks. And I said to that, the Old Testament. Yes. It's the national epic of the people called Hebrews. True. It's more than that to Jews and Christians, but it is at least that. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. In fact, the Bible and Homer are basically the foundations of Western culture. And it's interesting that Hebrew and ancient Greek are children of the Phoenician alphabet. Hebrew and ancient Greek came from the Phoenician alphabet. We'll talk about that in a little bit because there's some neat, neat things that were done by one fascinating person that helped us a lot. This is cuneiform. Cuneiform was invented uh, in Sumer, the Sumerian uh, culture in southern Mesopotamia. 
4000 BC, so it, it, and it was used to write many different languages. As it marched up the Fertile Crescent, it wound up in the middle of Turkey. We'll talk about this you know, uh, a little bit later in, in the talk. So it was available for many different languages, but again, it was not a literary language. It was for po political and economic purposes, primarily. So who invented the Greek alphabet? How did this all happen? How do we write what we say and say what we read, as I mentioned earlier? The hypothesis is that one really smart person did it. The linguists who have looked at all of this and looked at linear B, which is a proto-Greek, uh, which preceded Greek, uh, as we are talking about it, uh, have looked at this and said, this probably was done by one really smart guy living on the island of Euboea. Euboea is a long island off the east coast of Greece. And that's where the oldest archaic ancient Greek is discovered. And it's also found in Euboean colonies in Italy. So the first Greek was probably thought of by some guy who said, you know, if you can take the Phoenician alphabet, which is all consonants, and you add enough vowels, then you can have, oh, we'll call it an alphabet, and you can say what you read, and you can write what you say. That had never been done before. We don't know who it was. As I've said, I assume it's one person because the people who have written the books on, on writing that I've read have, have felt that way. Probably off the coast, probably on the island of Euboea, probably in the 8th century BCE. And take a look at this simultaneously with, and I put the because of Homer in there. Nobody can tell me that I'm wrong. So, in my fantasy, this guy is sitting on the island of Euboea and he just heard Homer and he said, damn, that is so good. I gotta write that down, but wait a minute. <laughs> There's no way to do that. And so, I think it's possible that the genius of Homer in its presentations in the 8th century BCE stimulated some wonderful person, and we can't thank him enough, or her enough, to figure out how to write it down, but then it happened. So Homer and Greek come together simultaneously. And when that happens, it's the oldest form of writing. We've talked about the Euboean settlements in Italy. And here's an interesting fact. That language, as it emerged immediately, was not used for political or economic purposes. It was used for the next 200 years primarily for literary purposes. That's not exclusively true, but that's one of the things that distinguishes it from cuneiform and hieroglyphics, in my opinion. So, as soon as Greek was invented, it spread all over the Mediterranean. Uh, by the 6th century, there were examples of it everywhere. And I thought that one of the things that I would like to do uh, as we uh, swing into the last part of, of today is I picked some fascinating time sequences from then until now and to show you how Homer was picked up and used and how Homer influenced uh, these uh, different, uh, different times and different people. 6th century BCE, copies of Homer are all over the Mediterranean. So the language works. And it's not just for scribes. A lot of people, you can learn Greek. An average person can learn Greek. It doesn't have to be a specialized task. Pisistratus was one of the tyrants. His family were tyrants in 6th century Athens. And he wanted to conscript a Homer and say Homer is Athenian. And he started the Panathenaea, where Homer was recited, at least in the first one, in 576 BC, I think. And Pisistratus said, you know, there's a problem. So many people are taking Homer and think they can make him better. They add a little here, they take off a little there. They say, oh, this word shouldn't be there. And he said, we're starting to see all kinds of modifications of Homer, and that's bad. So Pisistratus the tyrant of Athens said, we're going to have a standard version of Homer. It's called the Pisistratean recension. And at that point, standard versions of Homer were assembled and were probably what we have more or less today. The fourth century BCE, you cannot go from then till now and not trip over Alexander the Great in some way. This amazing guy, he was born in 356 BC. His father, Philip II, had unified Greece. 
When he was 20, his father was about to embark on a big campaign against the Persians. And he wanted to demonstrate how powerful he was. His daughter was being married to an Alexander. And so everybody from around the realm was invited. And in the, in the ceremony, in the Colosseum, they decided to have a special event. And Philip II made a critical mistake. He said, I will look so powerful that I don't need to be accompanied as I walk in. My family will come in front of me and my family will come behind me, but I will stand there. And we are going to call this the celebration to the 12 gods and me. I'm the 13th god. You see where I'm going in this. There's a, a little inflation going on here. Well, he made a huge mistake because as he was walking in, a man named Pausanias with a long knife put it right between his ribs and killed him in front of everyone. Pausanias was immediately killed. All the people that were threatened by Alexander were killed. Alexander, the son of Philip II, winds up as the king of Macedonia. Whether he played a role in his father's murder is conjectural. I think he probably did. Uh, there were many other people that died very quickly after that, all related to him. They were all murdered or killed in some way. But Alexander takes over. And one of the first things he wants to do is chase Darius, who's come around there, and Alexander, who's already earned a great reputation as being a wonderful commander, is leading his troops around. He's chasing Darius, and he captures Darius's family. But he doesn't capture Darius. And in the tent where Darius's family is is a gold box. And Alexander the Great says, that gold box, that's going to be just perfect for me to keep my copy of the Iliad. He traveled with the Iliad, and he put the Iliad in the gold box and took it with him. And when he got to Troy, Troy probably still there, Alexander got out and took the weapons that Achilles had left there four to 500 years ago, if you believe this true, and he left his own there. He said, I'll take Achilles' weapons. Alexander is important to us because in his genius, he decided not to chase Darius all the way back to Babylon. He went around and he founded the city in in Egypt called Alexandria. And he founded it because of a dream he had. And he was dreaming about the island of Pharos, which comes up in the Odyssey. And he said, that dream is important. I need to found a city by that island. And so he did. And while he was doing that, he took his own architects with him. He said, I want the great library to be right here. Alexander died before they built the city of Alexandria and before they built the library. But in 300 BC, when Ptolemy II, I think, was running Egypt at the time, and the city was built, the library was there, the library was the centerpiece of all learning in the Mediterranean. And the beautiful words over the door, as you walk in the library, this is the healing place of the soul. That was, those are the words over the library at Alexandria. 123 Sophocles plays, Euclid, everybody was working there. It was an amazing place. And although it was destroyed, all the elements that remain from that library, half of them are Homer. Half of them are Homer. When you think of all the great playwrights, all the great uh, authors from the ancient world, if half of what was at the library at Alexandria were Homer, you get a sense of how important he was. And Alexander the Great knew that. This is a fun story to tell. In the 10th century, in Constantinople, an unknown scribe is sitting there, and his boss said, I need another copy of the Iliad. So a copy of the Iliad is done by an unknown person and resides in the library in Constantinople. It's ultimately called the Venetice, and we'll come to explain why that's true, but it's a lovely part of the story of how Homer gets to us today. 
As we go forward, Boccaccio was the first professor of Greek in Italy. And in 1453, Constantinople falls. This is important because at the very end, the only Greek speaking part of the world was in Constantinople. That was the last Hellenistic part where Greek was continu continually spoken. And the Sultan, I think his name was Mehmet I, who was attacking Constantinople and destroyed it in 1453, ended the Greek speaking uh, Hellenistic world at the time. But before that happened, Basileus Bessarion was a cardinal in their church. And he was invited to try to find some reconciliation between the church in the east and the west. He was unsuccessful, but he was a very good politician and he himself was Greek. And in his travels between uh, Constantinople and Italy and his love for Greece, he realized that the Greek story was coming to an end that the Ottomans were going to take over ultimately in Constantinople. And he wanted to create some place where he could have a repository of Greek treasures that could be used to start a new Greece. And so he started to import books from Constantinople. He did it from 1420 all the way up until just before his death. He brought in this magnificent trove of works, including this 10th century Venetus A. He really didn't know what he had. He just wanted everything he could get was Greek. When he died, he gave everything to the city of Venice for their library, and they built a library. If any of you have ever been in St. Mark's Square, you know the beautiful pillar with the line of St. Mark's there, and you're looking out at the canal, the building right on your right with the pillars, that's the Mariana, that's where the library is, and that's where the Venetus A is located. Now, the Venetus A is a big deal, and I'll show you a picture. Actually, I'll show it to you right now. Then we'll come back to the rest of this. This is what it looks like. 360 pages of vellum done in a codex format. And here's the story here in Greek. But what's all this? All that is called the scolia. And the scolia are works from the ancient world, from Alexandria, the third, second, and first century BCE, Aristarchus, Denodotus, Aristophanes, the great librarians of that library, would write what they thought was their commentary about Homer. These were really smart people. They loved Homer, and they were very thoughtful about their critique and discussion of this. This kind of work was available to the scribe sitting in Constantinople in the 10th century. And he was smart enough not only to make a copy of the Iliad, but to inscribe all the original commentary uh, as scolia in the margin. And so we have this beautiful book in that library with scholarship that goes back to the third century BCE of what Homer was trying to say. That's been protected for us through this unique document. By the time we get to the 15th century, obviously, with the uh, printing of the Bible, Homer's printed, and we have a standard version pretty much since then. In 1870, those of you may have heard about Heinrich Schliemann. He's the guy that decided he would discover Troy. He was a complete amateur, but a passionate one. And he'd made a million dollars selling stuff to the warring armies in Crimea. He made his escape and went to California and sold gold to the Rothschild family. I mean, you get the idea of what kind of person he was. And along the way, he, he ditched his first wife, had a quickie divorce in Iowa, and married a 16-year-old girl from Greece. <laughs> but he was really wealthy, and he was determined to find Troy. And he actually did. I find him a fascinating character, and I've always thought he was a thug. But when you talk to the people in Greece, they don't see, that, see him that way. They said, without him, we wouldn't have discovered any of this stuff. So they see Schliemann differently. But I put him in here simply because he was the one that discovered Troy. The story is a fascinating one. I won't tell it to you tonight. But it's easily discovered. And he, with some help, found it. And he found some magnificent treasure in Troy. And then he said, well, we find Troy. Let's find where Agamemnon came from. That was Mycenae. Nobody knew. I'll show you some pictures of Mycenae a little bit later, 
But he discovered Mycenae too. He discovered the mask of Agamemnon. We'll see that. So he comes up with uh, discoveries that tend to incarnate the factuality of these stories, that they were not just myths, that there was a that there was an event that occurred. Now, a lot of what's been built around that is mythical, but there was some fact to it, and that's what's so interesting about Schliemann. In the 1890s, a whole trove of cuneiform documents was discovered in the middle of Turkey. And the interesting part here is that they talk about the Trojan War from the other side. That had never been done. The only, re the only resource we had to talk about the Trojan War was Homer, until this. And now you can read these little cuneiform documents that talk about the uh, Ahiyawas, which are really the Achaeans. That's the same name for the, Tro for the Trojans, or for the Greeks, excuse me. And they talk about Alexandros, who was the king in Troy. Well, the alternative name for Paris, the prince of Troy, was Alexander. So it's pretty clear that there was another recording of those conflicts from the other side. And that, I think, is fascinating. But nobody thought you could recite a poem of 12 or 16,000 lines. That really, no, it had to have been written down. You couldn't have memorized it. You couldn't have synthesized it. Until Milman Parry, premature death from Harvard, found some people in Yugoslavia that were illiterate but could do the same thing. And he was able, through his scholarship, to show that in the modern world, people could tell stories 16, 20,000 lines long without being able to read or write. So that Homer really did do what we think he did. And the last part of what I would like to show you today before we adjourn is uh, a trip that I just came back from where I was invited to go to the archaeological dig in Kefalonia where uh, a fascinating group of people think they've discovered Odysseus's home. Now as improbable as that is, let me show you why I'm captured by this possibility. Robert Brittlestone was a brilliant guy. And he, was, he, knew, the, he, knew, he knew the Odyssey. And the Odyssey in Homer says, Odysseus comes from the farthest west portion of Greece. And everybody had been looking at the island now called Ithaca, which is not the farthest west portion of Greece. It's a little island, a little bit to the east. And so everybody thinks that the modern island of Ithaca must have been his place. Well, it probably wasn't, because the modern island of Ithaca has only been called that for about three or 400 years. And there's some very good evidence that a tiny little peninsula attached to the westernmost island called Kefalonia that became a peninsula instead of an island because of an earthquake probably was where Homer, uh, probably where Odysseus came from. And so Robert Biddlestone began the work and John Crawshaw was my host uh, who uh, encouraged me to come over there and I spent some remarkable time with him. And let me share just a couple of these stories with you. This is a piece of the island of Kefalonia. Uh, you can see how beautiful this must be with these beautiful bays. And this is the island. This is called the Paliki Peninsula. And Brittlestone and Crawshaw's hypothesis is that there was once a, a channel of water here. Strabo, the first century geographer, agrees that there was. So that at one time this was an island, that it became a peninsula to the bigger portion of Kefalonia here because of an earthquake and a landslide which dumped all this into this area here. So much of the work that's been done now has to be, been to prove that. But let me show you some of the beautiful sites that we found on Kefalonia and why I think I was standing at Odysseus's pig farm. <laughs> First of all, this is an... Armor. Yeah. Before we leave, first... I yeah. Going, I'm going to tell Chris Matthews he's 2,500 years too late. <laughs> but I want to ask you about when you said 6th six, century, it was disseminated throughout the Mediterranean. Yeah. What countries did that include and what languages was it uh, written in? It would have been in Greek, in the Greek diaspora, which included Sicily, uh, Italy, all around the Levant, probably even into the Black Sea. So there were, there were uh, Greek colonies all over that portion. Marseille, and perhaps even out farther than that. So all the, the Greeks were everywhere. It was amazing where they were colonizing. And where there was a Greek colony, there would be a copy of Homer. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Please, pardon us. 
This was an olive tree that I thought was so beautiful. And olive trees are very important in the story of, of, uh, <coughs> of the Odyssey. So we'll come back to that. But I thought you might enjoy this. This is John Crawshaw, and I'll, sh and I'll let him speak for himself on a couple of the places that we've seen. With apologies, this is done with my iPhone, and it was really windy. We almost got blown off the summit of this rock we were standing. So if it distorts the sound a little bit, I'll translate it for you. But let's hear what he has to say. Now standing in Acne Bay. Acne Bay. This is the location we believe was where Telemachus landed uh, when he was on his return journey visiting Pylos and King Nestor and was returning to Ithaca, but he wanted to avoid the suitors who were lying in wait for him. So his crew dropped him off in this little cove, and then they went around to enter the regular way to Ithaca, to the uh, harbor, and the suitors lying in wait missed out. I don't know if you could hear that, but at the end of the Odyssey, Telemachus has to come home to Ithaca and Odysseus has to come home. Well, this is where they think Telemachus landed. <coughs> and I was talking with John. I said, well, John, what about this little stream here? And he said, if you read Homer, there's a stream in that bay where Telemachus lands and you can see the stream just flowing gently underneath these rocks. <coughs> Where Odysseus landed, <coughs> Homer clearly describes it. There's a long sandy beach. So when the Phaeacians row him up quickly, they scoot all the way up on the sandy beach. That's a sandy beach. The last one we looked at was a rocky beach. But that was perfect for where you would land if you were Odysseus coming back to your home. <coughs> okay. uh, when the road was being built here, um, the uh, road builders uh, exposed a vet beside the road and a friend of Robert Bittlestone's opened it up when Robert was here and uh, this narrow vent um, it was discovered contained stalagmites and stalactites and what's important about the cave of the nymphs is that the nymphs work on stone looms and people have always assumed that stone looms meant stalagmites and stalactites. When Odysseus comes back home he has all this loot and he has to hide it and he hides it in the cave of the nymphs. Well, the cave of the nymphs, who are weaving on stone looms, which are stalactites and stalactites, may have been discovered <coughs> by the men doing this road work. <coughs> now, when I play this, uh, remember Odysseus and Telemachus are coming together. And they know it's very dangerous to go back to the palace because they're in trouble. So they're going to go to a dear friend of theirs who happens to be their pig farmer. Take a look at Odysseus's pig farm. We're now at the place that we believe that could well have been Eumaeus's pig farm. Uh, you can see an enclosure uh, surrounded by stones that would have been a good place to keep a herd of swine uh, safe. And you can imagine that uh, this, this location has probably been used for hundreds of years for this purpose. So those are very old Mycenaean walls. They're called Cyclopean walls. They're from 12th century BCE. And it's his hypothesis that uh, that was the pig farm. I mentioned this to Emily Wilson, who spoke with us last week. And she said, well, you have to go look for some, some fossilized pig dung when you, go, <laughs> when you go back there. I thought, OK, that's my, ne that's my next trip. Uh, 
I think you can see how beautiful this landscape is. And I don't know if you're impressed, but I was. There was nobody there. These sites are not protected. The government barely knows about this. They give a little bit of money to help with this. But we walked all over the place, asked a local farmer who said, oh yeah, you want a Mycenaean tomb? There's one over here. Let me show you. <coughs> And this. So I was shown uh, this whole site with the tombs in it by a farmer called Gerasimus Monagrusso. He's in his 80s. He's self taught in the sense that he's learned how to read Homer. He's even written in a sort of ancient uh, type of Greek. And when he first showed me this area, uh, this little problem that we're looking at, he said, I'm convinced, said the farmer, I'm convinced that this is where the tomb of Odysseus lies. Now there's some undiscovered or unexcavated Mycenaean tombs here, which, which John knows about and was able to show me, but he's keeping it under wraps because there's a lot of competition in this work. But the other thing that was so amazing to me was what the locals know. They know all kinds of stuff that we are shocked to find. You remember when they discovered Lawson Meadows and the, and the Vikings had been on Newfoundland for the people who were running the farms up there said, oh yeah, we should have shown you the rocks that are over there where they all came a thousand years ago. So the locals know a lot of stuff. So why is Homer important? He's the foundation of Western history and culture. He came along with the invention of the alphabet, which is a prof amazing accomplishment, human accomplishment. <clears throat> His stories give us the first clear artistic manifestation of the human psyche and soul. <clears throat> it's an art unsurpassed artistic accomplishment, and he's still relevant. Emily Wilson gave us a new translation, and I want to go back and dig some more. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so we have a couple of minutes if you'd like to ask questions. If you don't, I, I can tell you a little bit about how next week goes. Can I please? Um, next week, we're going to start with the Iliad, and we're going to talk about the specifics, the, the, the lines. I would like some of us, please, to agree to read some of the lines. You don't have to do anything more than read them, but it's better that you than I. My, my voice throughout the day, throughout the evening would be not so good. So anybody that would like to do some reading, raise your hand and I'll give you the lines here. They're in the handout. You can look them up in your copies of, of, uh, of Fagel's translation. But I'd be glad to pass these out. We can do that quickly. Anybody? Great. Janice, you got book one? There's great stuff in there. Oh, book two, who's lucky? Oh, Mary. Thank you. Book three? Thank you. Book four will probably, oh, you're perfect for book four. Oh. <laughs> if there was a born book four. Thank you. Book seven, anybody? Thank you. There's not a lot here. Book, book nine, there's only 10 or 15 lines. 11 and 12. Okay, so I can't remember who picked these, so when you come next week, please remember that you're doing them. Which one you're doing. Which one you're doing. But the group over here, they didn't even raise their hands. Anybody over here? Okay, there's only a few, Hal. Okay. I'm sure we can do it. I don't know. Oh yeah, how about one line? One line, this is a, per that's per, you'll love that. There's one line. Got one left? Okay, this is me. Jerry. No, no, you go ahead. I know, Jerry, you're better. I love your voice, Jerry. And there's more, uh, what's, what's it called? Just a few glasses. Yeah. <laughs> so before we adjourn, are there any questions? Please. No questions, but, uh, Recently, I finished the book called God by Hank Oslin. And the picture of the dude with the. Um, yeah, the sorcier. Yeah, and also the first temple. 
Go back to the tapi. We're both in his book. He was claiming the creature with the horns is the first human conception of God. Hmm. And uh, the temple, he argues, he's, he argues that religion <coughs> created agriculture, not vice versa. Isn't that interesting? That they needed so many people to build that, and they had to stay on site. They had to figure out a way to produce food to build the temple. So it's not agriculture produced religion, but religion produced it's, it's a fascinating idea, and you, and you can't argue it. One of the things that I found so interesting in my recent trip was looking at the Eleusinian mysteries, which were basically a feminine, a, a, a matriarchy, that preceded the patriarchy that we've lived under now since, since Homer, and what it was like uh, for that. The, also, the Oracle of Delphi and how that was different from the Eleusinian mysteries and then the Escalapian healing sites. The Greeks had so many fascinating ways of looking at all of this that it wouldn't surprise me if the need for agriculture came from that uh, need for building these. But the assumption is that the people that invented the agriculture were the women. They were the ones standing behind, and if you look at the Eleusinian mysteries, the three goddesses that are important to that, they knew that you could take the seeds from the grain and plant them in the ground and you get grain next year. That was a very powerful observation, and the guys didn't know that, but the women did. And so the agriculture, well, the guys are out hunting. They didn't know. And so the women have a very important role to play. And probably that was one of the fundamental underpinnings for the matriarchy uh, that existed in the Minoan culture that preceded the Mycenaean. And one of the fascinating questions for us today is why did that change occur? Because we're in, in the Me Too conversation that we're having now are having this kind of conversation that they were having 3,500 years ago. I had thought that Homer was not the only person running around reciting. Yeah. Did he, were there other yes. people reciting his work or were they reciting other work? I think I, there, there was a whole group called the Homeridae. I think that's the point you're making. Yeah. There was a sort of a clan of people who were capable of doing that. Homer was the best uh, the, of the bards. Uh -huh. uh, and they were probably doing his work and their own work. Uh -huh. uh, but. None of them are, are known the way Homer is, and I don't know them. Jerry. Uh, I just want to be happy to all of us. Thank you. Uh, Thank I've you. listened to you for, what, 40 years or so of lecture. <laughs> Nothing like this. <laughs> very, very much. Thank you. Well, next, next week we'll dig into the Iliad, the first 12, uh, 12 books, and I, it'll be a lot different from tonight, and I hope as much fun. Thank We're you. Have more of this? <laughs> we have another bottle. We have another bottle. Okay.